pleased now to turn it over to our partners from Springfield Public Schools, Sheila Boozer and Debbie Thomas. Good afternoon, everyone. This looks so exciting. Um, I just have to say that it is a breath of fresh air working with REL Midwest um, over the past few years, having this information at our fingertips available to us from um, researchers that we can apply because being a practitioner in a school district that serves students from all walks um, and that deserve the best and the most quality education, it is a powerful tool and resource to have REL Midwest and the resources available to us. Um, I've, I've really excited to know that every single component that has been presented really solidifies what we do in our district in Springfield 186, um, starting with that whole having um, that seeking to adopt and, and well, to adopt and, and seek and, and observe and making sure we have those strong family partnerships um, and, and focusing on a strong tier one instruction um, and then thinking about how tier two and tier three comes into play when needed. But we have to make sure that tier one is accelerated um, and it's, a, it's, it's an inviting, it's a joyful experience and we're motivating our students to wanna learn. So with that being said, I'm going to just talk a little bit about how we're gonna move into what we call um, our summer learning fifth quarter um, for Springfield Public Schools. And it's exciting because our goal is to really continue the learning um, as, simly, as, as seamlessly as possible from our fourth quarter into the summer without making it feel like school is long and drawn out. So we really wanna make this fun and, and engaging. So we're gonna call it our fifth quarter, so to speak. Um, and we, we've, we've seen some growth and we, we, we wanna to continue to see that growth. And I loved it when I heard that this is not a race, um, but it's about quality and it's not looking at students didn't learn because our students have been learning. Um, and, and, and we hear that teaching hasn't been happening, but our teachers across the country and in 186, Springfield 186 have been teaching and we want to make sure we can continue to extend that. So we have a lot of academic and social emotional needs that we just wanna make sure that we are addressing. So our plan over the summer includes extending summer learning um, are extending our summer learning time frame. In the past, it was only been it's only been three weeks, but this year, this summer, we want to extend it to six weeks with some flexible schedule for our, for our teachers, because realistically, we know some of our teachers are exhausted just as our families and our kids are exhausted. So we don't wanna burn, burn everyone out. So we are having a flexible schedule. So for example, one group of teachers can teach for the first three, three weeks of, of the summer program. And then another group can teach the um, next three weeks. And then we built in a plan or we're building in a plan for to, to share the data um, between those teachers around the students so that there's a, a seamless handoff, so to speak. Um, we've also removed barriers for this process and this program over the summer. Um, in the past, we've had criteria where we could only have a certain amount of students participate. So we're opening it up for all of our students to be eligible. Um, and by doing that, that means we have to open up multiple sites. So we have some school flexibility um, for, those, for those schools, but we also have set some district parameters to make sure that um, all of our students are getting it with what they need. We're meeting our students where they are. Um, we are planning to do some additional learning opportunities after the summer program. So right before school starts, if a school decides they wanna do something and bring in a group of students and, and work with them right before the beginning of the school year, um, they can do such things, um, do, that, do, that, do that kind of work as well. Um, and we can't do this without our community partners. Community partners are crucial to this work. Um, and with that, we, some of our community partners, we look at our, um, we have a Camp Compass, we have Boys and Girls Club, we have the Urban League, we have 21st Century, and I'm sure there are other community organizations out there um, that are partnering with us. Um, and what we're doing is working together to make sure we're providing our students exactly what they need, not what we think they need, but what they need. Um, based upon the data, which drives, takes me to the next piece. And I'm speaking fast because I got to share this time with my, my colleague, Debbie Thomas. But we also want to make sure we have data-driven offerings to meet the varying needs of our students. Um, and so we, we're going to have a small set of prioritized um, standards and skills that we want to make sure our students um, are exposed to in order to be ready to learn for the next grade level once the next school year begins. But we don't want to just 
stay there and be skill driven because it's more than that. We want to make sure this is a joyful experience. So with that being said, we're incorporating some social and emotional learning because our students have gone through quite a bit over this, these past, um, this past year with so much they've seen and experienced in, in the news, in their own homes. Um, and, and, and we've heard it several times before from others, um, um, great speakers and researchers who've talked about the different pandemics that our students and families are experiencing, you know, the academic, the, the COVID, we're talking about social emotional issues that they're experiencing. We're talking about them having economic issues that they're um, going through, um, the racial pieces. So we have to make sure that we're like making sure our students and our families are okay and are ready to learn um, in, in, in multiple ways because they've been learning all along. So with that being said, we're gonna make sure we infuse this, pro this, this, this program over the summer with technology. Um, we're gonna make sure it has some enrichment pieces in there so we can send home um, like, like care packages, so to speak, or fun packages for our students. Um, if they wanna cook something at home, so all the ingredients will send those home and the kids can read and follow the directions. So that's gonna also incorporate some reading and some math. So those are some of the things we're talking about doing, and there, there are more to it, but this is, a, this is a brief overview. So we're really fully invested in advancing the learning opportunities for all of our students with the summer learning being the first step. But it's equally important to make sure we continue this work into the fall. Um, so we've adjusted our curriculum guides to meet the needs of our students. Um, one of our most important focuses is how to differentiate instruction through small group instruction and through interventions that we will also provide. Um, and so the first step we'll see is where our students are um, functioning and where they are ready to learn when they come when they return into our buildings. So with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to my colleague, Debbie Thomas, so she can really go more into the, the guide um, of differentiation and intervention for our school district. Debbie, you're I'm on gonna, Yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna pick up right where she left off and talking about how we're going to plan for gauging where our students are when, when they come back in the fall. Uh, we've had some real success with assessing students this year, even in the remote setting. We've also had some real challenges, as I'm sure many of you have had. And so we know it's gonna be really important during that, right at the start of the year, to um, have an accurate read on our students' strengths and their needs. And once we have that information, then our plan really begins. So we want to have a small set of skills identified by grade level. So we know that some of our students are going to come with some pretty big needs and that can be overwhelming. And so we want to make sure that we have narrowed it down to say, if first graders are coming in and they have these needs, where do we start? What are the very few skills that we absolutely need students to master right away? And so then um, once we have those skills identified, then we need to think about, okay, how will we know if they are mastering those skills? And so we are identifying a few assessments that teachers can have at their fingertips and um, as well as considering ways to assess through daily learning experiences. So for example, um, instead of you know, constantly stopping to assess, we want teachers to use their instruction as assessment. So if a, if a teacher is having students, for example, writing CVC words on individual whiteboards, the teacher can be observing and taking note of where the students are with their phonics acquisition. So um, then the assessment is, is actually part of the instruction. And then the, the, the third part that we really want to think about is um, how can we help teachers have a strong toolbox so that they have a few effective instructional tools for each of those skills that they are wanting kids to master. So on the next slide, you'll see just a visual of a little snippet of a document that we're working on for our district. And this is a first grade example. So you'll see in that first column, a few prioritized skills. And actually these are all kindergarten skills that based on our on this year's data, we know we will have a lot of students needing to work on those. So right at the beginning of the year, 
these are the skills that we really want to work on in our small group differentiated instruction as well as an intervention. And then the next column you see what are a few assessments that we could use. And I will tell you, we're already going to revise this document again because um, we realized we need to add in there some of those suggestions for the um, ways to gather that information through instruction. And then in the third column, you see those instructional tools that teachers can use. There are so many tools out there. So we're just trying to narrow it down so they have a starting place of some of the more effective um, ways to really address those skills. And then this is for the beginning of the year, but then the document goes on to say, okay, and then what's the next set of skills and the next set of skills? And the other thing that's on this document, um, there's a couple of things you can't see. One is comprehension is not on this little slice, but I want you to know that it absolutely is in the document because we believe that, that connecting meaning tightly to that word solving work is so important. And then the other thing that you can't see on here is the um, phonological awareness and phonics continuum. So teachers can say, okay, here's the first set of skills, but I have students maybe that are above that or below that. They'll have that progression then to be able to tell right where they need to start with their students so that they can differentiate effectively. So I can tell you that this is definitely a work in progress for us. And um, even today, I've been learning more and thinking about how you know, we can adjust our plans for the future. We've heard such great ideas and I'm anxious to put what we've learned into practice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheila and Debbie. At this point, we're gonna launch into our panel discussion and I invite all of our presenters to join me on video. And I also invite all of our attendees to enter questions that they might have into our chat box. So we're gonna to start today's discussion off with the first question here, which is what should district administrators do to prepare for literacy instruction and assessment in the fall of 2021? And I'm gonna pick on Sheila. She knew that was coming. She knew it was coming because I always pick on her. Yeah, I was hoping someone else would, would speak <laughs> up, but um, <laughs> basically everything we've already discussed here um, from the very beginning um, with, um, I was Dr. Duke who explained the fact, you know, making sure your tier one instruction is, is um, on point, but not so much worried about some, uh, you know, loss from learning from the pandemic because learning has been, has continued. I think one of the things that district administrators need to do for, to prepare is to see where our students are ready to learn and meet them where they are and don't have a mindset of we're going to make all this up in um, a year because we're not. That doesn't even make sense to even try to do that. Meet each student where they are and create plans for them and, and bring the teachers to the table and, and help make sure your teachers are strong with data and you're creating a data literate system so that data can be your friend, but it shouldn't, it, you, you can't stop with just that. It's the whole child. So thinking about it from that perspective as well, is, is the literacy, literacy instruction equitable? Is it bringing in and meeting the kids where they really are? Are we taking into consideration their social and emotional needs while we're doing all these things? Are we making sure our teachers are okay? So, and, and are we partnering with our parents and families? So those are the things that I say as a district administrator. I could just add in, I agree with everything that was just said. Um, I would just wanted to put in a plug for um, districts considering putting into place tutoring programs or if they already have them expanding tutoring programs. I'm suggesting that because we know that a high dosage tutoring, meaning tutoring that has uh, frequent meetings during the week of a certain length of time um, is associated with student growth, even when the um, teachers are paraprofessionals or even volunteers with the right program and structure, they can still make a big difference for students. And although you could argue that any year it would be good to have, you know, tutoring available for students, I think we could all agree that it might be especially important to have 
um, tutoring available um, for the coming year. There's a, a nice um, piece I'll drop in the chat um, that researchers at Brown University put together that summarizes some of the research on effective tutoring models and points to a few specific models. Um, so that's something I, I might add in as a special consideration for district administrators right now. Totally agree, 100%, 100%. So our second question here for the panel is, children follow different developmental trajectories in developing reading and writing skills. And the question is, how can classroom educators understand and serve children given what we expect to be a wide variation in skill development in the fall of 2021? I'll just say my first thought on that is that it's going to be more important than ever that we provide some very concise and explicit whole group instruction that is brief so that we have time then to really provide the differentiated small group instruction that we need. It's just so easy to turn mini lessons into maxi lessons. And we're, we think we're doing great teaching and then we realize, oh, the, the students aren't actually listening anymore. So if we can keep that brief, so then we can really spend our time in that differentiated small group instruction. To see that I think teachers have always managed to have many different children with many different strengths and many different areas of need. Um, and certainly in pre-K to grade three, that's business as usual <laughs> to have a range yeah. of, in terms of where kids are. And so I would um, just encourage everybody to know, yeah, it'll probably be a little more extreme this year. Maybe there'll be a little bit more difference, but you know, we, we've got this, we know how to do this. We've done this before. It, it's following uh, Debbie's very wise advice. You know, when most of the class needs something, teach it whole class, be brisk. And then from there, we do our differentiation. And when the teacher is with a small group, we make sure that what the other children are doing is productive. Um, things like partner reading, for example, has very strong Certain models of partner reading have very strong research support. So those would be a really, that would be a really good thing for kids to be doing when, when they're not with the teacher. So I just, um, just want to give us a, we can do this. We've got it. And I love the fact that you brought out that we've already been doing this. Um, it's nothing new. It's just a thing maybe a little bit more intense because it's everyone is, is seen it everywhere. But I think the piece that makes it more doable, if we just remember that everyone, every school, every teacher is experiencing the exact same thing. So we're all in the pool together, so to speak. So um, it, it's not unique. We're not unique in that regard, but we can be, we can meet the needs of all of our students, but it's gonna take time, intensity, and it's also, we have to be uh, methodical. And um, we also need to be intentional in how this, we make this happen. Great. So now I'm gonna deviate from the questions that we have um, prepared to start addressing some of the questions that are showing up in the chat box. Uh, here's a question for you, Dr. Justice. Do you have a favorite tier two system to use? Uh, I really hate to um, make any sort of recommendation about a specific approach. Um, the only thing I'm gonna say, in, and I would actually look to some of my colleagues to jump in when I'm done because they might be more on the ground um, with respect to looking at success, um, successful programs. But I am gonna tell you that in general, I have a very, very strong bias towards the simpler, the better. Um, and so there's some, you know, old model, models that are out there. I think um, Nell mentioned um, tutoring program. Um, the voluntary tutoring program, there's an old model that's been around quite a while called Book Buddies, it comes out of University of Virginia, very simplistic approach. Um, and the reason I really push for that is because um, the easier something is to implement, 
the more likely we can scale it effectively. And so I actually got a long, long email earlier today from an educator about all the screenings that they use in their school and just lists and lists of screenings. And I thought, well, that's just too much. You won't know what to do with that. So, you know, I would look for um, the, so the solutions that are out there for structuring your tier two that are simpler um, rather than more complicated. Um, and then just be really attentive to how that's going. And maybe others can comment on specific um, programs they've used or approaches, I should say. Well, I support everything you just said. And I just add that when you're considering a program, what you wanna do is, is look for the research on it. Um, don't get that research from the people who are selling the program because mm -hmm. guess what? They always, always seem to have data to tell you that their approach works. Um, but rather um, going to Google Scholar, um, going to the What Works Clearinghouse, um, looking at research reviews, you know, that, that's how, you know, you can get uh, really data that you can trust more um, to see whether, you know, that's been a program that has shown positive effects and very important to look at as compared to what. So if you have an intervention program that's been proven to be effective compared to no intervention, that's not saying much, right? Um, it's, you know, is that intervention program effective compared to some other credible intervention program? That's where you start to, you know, feel confident. So I definitely suggest to people, you know, looking, looking at that research. And I love Dr. Justice's, um, you know, recommendation to also, you know, kind of keep it simple. Um, you know, look for, for those approaches that are tried and true, that have been effective in multiple studies, and, you know, that have a very clear, focus and probably brisk pace of instruction as well. And I just want to add to that. I, I being a practitioner, I love anecdotal data. <laughs> so I am not opposed to contacting other districts who have utilized the product or the program to see how it works to, and, and to see, get their perspective on how user-friendly it is. Do they have to spend a lot of time on the logistics of trying to make it work? Um, or is it simple and you get the results that you're needing? And then what is the demographic data? How are the, the different demographics um, and students responding to that intervention? So um, those, are, those are key questions that Debbie and I are not afraid to ask. We'll pick up a phone or email or what have you and, and call and ask because I totally agree. The practitioners utilizing the tool the, um, and the program makes a difference when you hear from them and they'll give you the truth, especially teachers. I think too that districts really do need to have the capacity to implement whatever that is effectively. Uh, and so, and not try to modify or morph something into what it isn't. And this comes back to Laura's comment about it being simple. If it's simple, it's more likely you can do that. But if, if you're looking at a particular uh, program or, or practice and it's complex and you're trying to fit it in with what you're doing, then that might not be the best approach. Um, just because it, this, the studies are done uh, as the, the program was intended to be um, delivered. And so if the district doesn't have that capacity to do it that way, then the likelihood that you'll receive the results that the study um, reflected is probably not as great. Great. So the next question that we have in the chat is, with regards to reading assessments, how often should students be assessed if they are reading at or beyond grade level? And also what reading assessments do you recommend? I think some of my colleagues know I love this question. <laughs> um, so um, for me, uh, we're, uh, observation is a form of assessment and we should be observing all the time. So we're always assessing. And that's one of the things you see in that exemplary teacher's literature. Um, I remember hearing uh, an, an anecdote of one of the, the researchers involved in that work, the late Michael Presley, um, sharing that in general, when you talk to exemplary teachers, they just know more about each student than more typical teachers do. They can just give you much more information. And part of that is they're making use of observation as an assessment tool in an ongoing way. Um, the uh, a, a somewhat more formal but still informal tool that I'll drop in the chat is um, something colleagues and I uh, 
have been working on for a while as an alternative to running records um, that we think is better aligned with research and our range of research. It's an informal tool. It's free on my website with lots of information about how to use it and examples. And basically every time a child's reading or writing, you have this tool um, and it directs your attention to specific aspects of reading and writing that have been shown in research to matter and to be good targets for teaching. And that way, on an ongoing basis, every time you see a child read or write, you're actually getting assessment um, data that can inform your grouping and your next steps in instruction. So I think for your students where you're not as worried about them, maybe they feel just in general like they're above you know, grade level expectations, they're still reading and writing. So this is a tool I would apply with them. And I would also you know, think about applying this or another observation guidance tool with um, students you know, who, who are not yet meeting grade level expectations as well to inform um, your targets of instruction on an ongoing basis. Three assessments a year is not enough. So if you just have, you know, your beginning, middle and end of the year assessment results, uh, that's, that's not going to do it. And, and you really do need to use some of these more formative and informal uh, tools as well. I had written down a note, Nell, to respond to that question with exactly what you just said, that um, it's, it's not the three times a year, although we do that. It is about how you're doing this in an ongoing way, you know, as part of instruction so that it is more seamless and not that, that stop to assess, stop to assess, stop to assess. Great. I think we have time for one final question. And Lori, this might be right up your alley. Uh, so the question is, do you have a recommended resource for families to connect with throughout the summer to support their young learners at home? So thinking particularly about K through one families who will not be in a summer in-person program, but who want to work on maintaining what they've learned throughout the year. All right. I really think that the, the website I shared during the webinar is probably one of the best resources for families because everything is presented very simply and those skills are, are directly from that foundational reading skills practice guide. And so that, you know, that shameless plug almost, but I think that's a really uh, wonderful resource during the summer for families to access and engage in those activities, view those videos, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that would be a valuable resource. Uh, that, that could be uh, of help to them. And then I just think that, you know, reading aloud to students, uh, for those students that can read themselves, listening to your children read, that's just so valuable and that time is very well spent. And so uh, making sure those experiences are positive and that, um, that you're reading with your children, reading to your children, and just engaging in some of those activities we provided, I think would be very helpful. Great. All right. Well, 